anyway, uh, so tonight we have a guest lecture by uh, Dr. Joe Marshalla. He's uh, going to give us a, a lecture on the mechanics of mind control and how to prevent it. So without further ado, Dr. Joe Marshalla. Thank you for coming. <sighs> Good evening, everyone. It's really a pleasure to be here. And uh, I don't even know if I can express the the honor that it is to finally be able to uh, give this lecture. Um, had a lot of really profound experiences in my life. And we're going to explore mind control maybe in a way that you're not familiar with. And to give you a little history about me, um, I really kind of woke up to all the things that we're learning here in this bookstore and all of the things that we understand about our government and the planet around 1983. And some people turned me on to some stuff about nuclear power and what were the truths about that and then the fluoridation of water and on and on and on. And so I just like, whew, was just like the sponge and just like took it all in and what have you. And um, really my quest to understand life all began when I was about 13 years of age and got hit by a car. And it was a kind of out-of-body, kind of near-death experience that I had. And I was trying to understand that, and I couldn't find anyone in my reality who could explain what I had experienced. And so six years went by, and I finally got to the university, and someone started saying, well, yeah, this is what you experienced, and this, and this, and this, and turned me on to the Tibetan Book of the Dead. And so my mind just opened up, and I realized, okay, I'm not insane. I did go out of my body. I did have this experience. But as a result of that, um, I found myself not open just to those types of things, but questioning all of reality. And so my life has been one of kind of dedicated service to our cause, why we're all here. And from organizing rainbow gatherings, if you've heard of rainbow gatherings, I've been involved in organizing three of those. One of them, which was the largest, almost 27,000 people showed up to that one. Um, Single-handedly closing down a nuclear power plant in central Illinois going up against the NRC. And <laughs> it was during that time that I began to realize that there was something that these debaters, because I would debate on television and on, on radio with the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, that they had a handle on something that I didn't have a handle on. And they were able to sway the room. And they were able to sway opinion. And I was like, what the heck is going on here? You know what I mean? Now, here's all the stats, here's all the statistics, here's all that, and la la la. And then they're able to like sway all this position. And so I finally, whenever I would do the debates, I would always ask to go first. And so they'd say, yeah, sure, go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. And so the very first thing I would say is I'd say, okay, everybody, here's the real. I'm going to share a whole bunch of information with you about what I understand is going on with this nuclear power plant. And then these guys are going to get up, and you have to understand that they are completely and totally well-trained professionals to take absolutely everything I can say and turn it around to make me look like I'm stupid and I have no reason having any concern whatsoever. So just <laughs> <laughs> be aware that that's what's going to happen tonight. And so that's how I would short-circuit that. Because then people would be like, hmm, you know, always kind of like listening to what they had to say, <laughs> you know, thinking about how they were being manipulated. So as a result of all of this kind of stuff, you know, other things that I've been involved in during the desert storm, I organized 50,000 people in the city of Seattle and personally, along with three of my friends, led them out onto I-5 and closed I-5 for five hours protesting that war. My hair used to be down to here. <laughs> I'm now a, a plainclothes hippie or undercover hippie or, you know, <laughs> whatever you want to call it. When I first got my hair cut, my kids couldn't, didn't recognize me. You know, I got off the airplane and I walked right by him and I finally came, excuse me, can I have a ride? It's like, Daddy, you know, <laughs> what had, they had never seen me with short hair, you know, so. So anyways, so to realize that there were mechanisms that were being used to control not only me, but control the various groups that I was involved in. When I would watch the news, I would hear all these different types of things, read the different types of books and what have you. And, and I realized that, um, that I really didn't understand what that playing ground was. 
what that playing field was. And and as a result of my death experiences, I was having you know because then I had drowned again in between all that. Okay, so here I have this 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 you know this I get hit by a car, right? And then I have a drowning experience when I'm like 30 years old. And then six years ago, um, I had a fatal coronary heart attack. And I was dead for 10 minutes, pronounced dead, and then came back. And uh, which was profound in and of itself. And I'll talk, if you, if you want to know more about that, there's a television interview about me at my website. You can go watch that interview that's specific about that. But what happened after that is that I had this three week window while I was laying in ICU and um, where I could go in and out at will. And, and as a result, I've mapped what I call the touch points because it got to the point where I could stop at the various places where we begin to interface with this physical world reality. And so I mapped that and I created the spectrum of those touch points. And as a result of that, I finally got the real picture of what mind control is. And so for the first time, in public, I'm sharing that information with you. I've shared it with friends, I've shared it with little groups here and there, but not on video, not to go out to Google video, which we're going to do. And so I'm really honored. Thank you for being here. Thank you for giving me the opportunity. And it just, it means everything because it's my life's purpose. So blessings to all of you and I appreciate that. Okay, so the smushy stuff is done. Uh, okay, a couple things I need to tell you. One, I am what is known as a holotropic thinker. Okay, what that means is I don't know how to think linearly. Okay, I don't. And I didn't know this all while I was growing up. I mean, nowadays I'd be called ADHD and dyslexic and all these other types of things. I'd put these labels on me per se. But uh, growing up, I just got by in school as a result of being a nice guy. Everyone liked me. He was <laughs> jovial. He wasn't, didn't get in trouble, didn't do anything, didn't do his homework. But he's still, he's a good guy and he's smart, you know. I mean, he's not stupid, you know. So they just passed me by, you know, and, and let me go off to college, which then I finally just dropped out. and decided to hitchhike across the nation for a year. And so I did that with my dog and my guitar and had a lot of really interesting experiences with that. But my point is, is that what you're going to experience tonight is holotropic thinking. Because I am... <laughs> it worked. Someone want to help us? <laughs> That's really cool. Okay, everybody up. Get those bodies moving. Yeah. I like big. <laughs> really, stop it. <laughs> Sorry about that, guys. You know, my radionic field is building. Whoa. <laughs> You know the inner thinking, the inner thoughts of my brain are being <laughs> broadcast. <laughs> I'm really a... <laughs> right, yeah. Uh, that was special effects at no extra charge. Uh, thank you very much. <laughs> That's really funny. So what happens with holotropic thinking basically is that I'm going to build a model. Okay, and it might seem like I'm being scattered and I'm like jumping from one subject to the next to the next, but essentially what I like to say is, or how I'd like to explain it is that I'm going to show you a house. Okay, and first we might go look up at one of the bedrooms upstairs and then we'll go look at the porch over here and then we'll look at the kitchen and we'll look at the garage and we'll look at the living room, but by the end of the lecture I'll pull it all together and you'll have a really good picture of the entire house. Okay, just to give you an idea of holotropic thinking, these are my notes <laughs> for tonight. Okay, this is a two-dimensional model of the three-dimensional model that's in my brain. Okay, now I submit right now that probably all of you that are in this room are holotropic thinkers because you can see the big picture. You can see so many of the different parts and you might not be able to express them in a linear fashion all the time, but you know. There's something within you that knows and can see it all and you're searching for ways to connect those various dots and that's one of the reasons why we're here tonight. Okay, So now, in order to understand mind control, 
what we have to do is that we as a group here tonight need to confront the mind control that is present in your brain right now that is running in the background. So we're going to run a little experiment today. And what I ask is that everything that I'm going to talk about tonight, I ask you to apply to yourself and yourself only. Because often what we'll do is we'll get information and then we'll externalize it. We'll say, well, yeah, he should know that or she should know that or if they own, you know what I mean? And we kind of do that. First of all, just apply it to yourself and then, uh, then we can move on from there. All right, so how many people would like to learn something new today? <laughs> Very good, okay. And how many of you would like me to teach you something new today? Okay. And what if I were to tell you that it is absolutely impossible, it's been proven psychologically, biochemically, neurologically, it is absolutely impossible for me to teach you anything. <laughs> Gets me off the hook. Right? <laughs> <laughs> yes, as she said up here, everything you've ever learned you taught yourself. No one has ever taught you anything. People have shown you things. <coughs> People have given you information, but it was your application of that information whereby then you taught yourself. So, you know, who taught you how to walk? Who taught you how to eat? Who taught you how to do two plus two? Someone may have showed it to you, but it was your doing it that then you had the quote-unquote aha experience, right? And learned something, tying your shoes. It wasn't until you tied them, hey, so you get the point. Riding a bike, on and on and on. It was you who taught yourself. So, I encourage you now, from this moment forward in your life, if you haven't been realizing that every moment of your life, to begin your day each day with the concept that I'm going to learn something new today. I want to learn something new today. Because one of my primary goals in my life that I set for myself is to antiquate everything I've ever learned every day to make it old. And part of my PhD and part of what I learned and <clears throat> what I established was um, I didn't discover per se, but I was the first one to define the here and now. I was the first one to define it in the laws of physics in the sense of a word came to me. I mean, that's really all it was. I was just sitting there one day contemplating all this stuff, and this word came to me, and everybody said, ooh, wow, that's cool. It means so much. And I said, oh, cool. I'll write it down. And, ooh, I got a PhD. Um, <clears throat> you know, but I discovered what is now being called throughout the world of philosophy and physics and psychology the law of repeatlessness. There's no two moments, no two experiences, no two anything that are ever the same. Life is constantly changing, growing, expanding. Every nanosecond, every particle, everything that exists in physical form and non-physical form is either taking on energy or shedding energy. That life is, in and of itself, a state of repeatlessness. And the only place where repeating occurs is through the perception of our minds. But it's not true. It can't be. It's not physically possible. So, one of the effects of mind control that we've already exhibited today and already have experienced right now in this room was the idea of who you learn by, how you learn. We have grown up in the model of education that exists today in our culture and across, across cultures all the way around the world is this idea that you sit in front of someone and someone bestows information upon you and they are the teacher. Who's in control of your learning in that environment? And then if you don't expose yourself to that system, can you be smart? Can you learn things? No, you need the institution. Mm -hmm. So think about it in those terms. All right. <clears throat> I'd like to start by telling a story, a real short little story. Imagine, if you will, you're out in the field and you notice this ant. 
and this ant is climbing to the top of this blade of grass and it's falling down. And it's climbing to the top of this blade of grass and it's falling time climbing, 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 keeps on trying to get to the top of this blade of grass. Now why? Why would this ant be trying to get to the top of this blade of grass and just sit there? What, what purpose does it serve? You know? Is there any purpose whatsoever? The answer is no. There is no purpose whatsoever for that ant to get to the top of that blade of grass. So is it just a fluke? And yes, it is a fluke. It's what's known as a lancet fluke. And a lancet fluke is a parasite that happens to reside in the stomachs of cows and sheep. And it just happens to commandeer the body of an ant, get into its brain and use it as an all-terrain vehicle to get to the top of that blade of grass so that then it can exhibit its suicidal behaviors. So this parasite has gone into the brain of this ant, commandeered it, and basically hitchhiked, or excuse me, hijacked that creature's brain. Is there anything else we've ever seen that is like that in our world? Television. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Every day. Going to work every day, on and on and on. You see, ideas, not worms, are that which hijack our brains. And if you think I'm suggesting that there's this relative, you know, minority population that is being affected by this, such as, you know, Islam whereby an idea that their life is to be of servitude to whatever Allah would like, so much so that it would lead them to suicidal behavior. If you think I'm just talking about small minorities of people, I'm here to tell you that it's much worse than that. In fact, probably almost every human being on the planet is being affected by such viral thinking. So how does it all begin? How do we begin to sort through all this stuff? Because, I mean, how many books do you have out here? How many videotapes? How many lectures have we heard about all the different things that are controlling our brains, whether it's the fluoride in our water or the television and the flicker effect and every, you know, 24th of a second they're putting some type of subliminal message in there and then backward message. How do you sort through all that? And the truth of the matter is, is that the only way anyone can have control over your brain is if you don't have control over your brain. So we're going to discuss what are the mechanisms of the brain, how the brain works, how we formulate thought, what are the current conditions of the brain, and then what we can do about it. And that's what today's lecture is. Because once you understand those mechanisms of how the brain works, then you will understand what things are working against it. Fair enough? Okay. <clears throat> All right, when you're born, you come into this world, and I like to call it, you're, you're a perfectly clean biocomputer, okay? And you've got just enough software to survive, enough to eat, enough to, you know, release, all that other kind of stuff, and you're just this fresh little biocomputer. And... <laughs> As time progresses, you begin to download information. Download information, download programs, download ideas. And we begin to develop a kind of a self-concept. For the first 18 months of our lives, though, we don't even have a separate concept of ourselves. For the first 18 months of our lives, your mother and you are one. And there's this other blob that comes in every now and then that takes you away from that oneness called your dad or brother or sister or something like that, but the self-concept con self does not exist. But during that first year and a half, there's been a whole bunch of people who have been defining who you are. Oh, she's this way, or he's that way, and he likes this, and oh, you're this one, and you're that one. And it is all these he, she, 
or you or him or her statements that begin to define who we are. And right about that two years of age period between 18 months and, and two years, our first I statements begin to be formed. I am this and I am that. And it is from those previous statements though that we begin to develop those I statements. All right? Now think about how many children are watching TV, how many children are being just sat in front of that little unit there, being bombarded with all the information of who they are and what they need, and look at these happy kids because they have this, and look at these sad kids because they don't have that, and all of our concept per se. Okay, but let's just stay with ourselves, that each one of us developed our, our concept. So if I were to ask you, who are you? Who are you? You know, and what I get is a lot of times is, well, I'm a man, or I'm a woman, or, you know, I'm a construction worker, or I'm a this, or I'm a that, and we have all these statements of who we are. Okay? Yet, all of those statements are based in the mind. All of those statements are based in time. Because they take time to occur. And I'm here to submit that who you are is not in time. Now I'm pushing against some of the mind control right now. And I'm willing to stand here and push against it. Because if there's anyone who's feeling a little bit uncomfortable, know that that uncomfortable feeling has nothing to do with me. It has everything to do with the biochemistry and what has been programmed into you not to think about. But until you know who you are, and really what you are, you are out of control. And you're hurtable and manipulatable. And that's just a fact. So, in my study of the human mind, 30 years of researching, I came across three pieces of research that happened in three different decades, and they had absolutely nothing to do with each other. But when you put their findings together in a particular sequence, sequence create an undeniable, irrefutable way to explain who we are, why we are the way we are, but then better than that, what we can do about it. So I'm going to convey those three pieces of research to you now. And I use a phrase to talk about these pieces of research. And they are unplugged, or the phrase is unplugged dog dreams. Unplugged stands for one of the pieces of research. Dog stands for another piece of research. And dreams for the last piece of research. So unplugged dog dreams. All right, so unplugged. Every single one of us has a little voice that's going on in our head. And it's just talking to itself. And someone's, someone might ask, well, what is he talking about? It's that voice <laughs> <laughs> that asked that question that I am talking about. Okay? That voice in the scientific community is known as subvocalization or self-talk. Okay? Now this thing is going on all day, every day. It just sits there talking to itself, and by the end of 24 hours, you've had approximately 50,000 self-talks in that day. What the heck are we talking to ourselves about? I mean, I can talk really, really fast. You can hear every single word I'm saying, just like really fast auctioneer, and your brain can talk to itself four times faster. In fact, they've proven that while I am lecturing here, you are talking to yourself more than you are actually listening to me lecture. <laughs> And you don't work with me here, you know? <laughs> so then science has proven through the biochemistry, because every single thought that you have actually has a chemical signature. Okay? So every thought that comes out of your brain elicits chemicals out of your mind, like this little pharmacy here. And every single one has a chemical signature. And so they've been able to measure that the average human being, like you and me, who has these 50,000 self-talks that are going on every day, Roughly 80% of them are negative or limiting in some way.
80% of them. So 40,000. We have 50,000 self-talks every day. 40,000 of them are negative or limiting in some way. Now, it even goes farther than that because of those 50,000 self-talk thought forms that we have every day, the average human being who's actually like paying attention to their self-talk is only aware of around 5% or 2,500 of those self-talks. So you got 50,000 self-talks going on every day. You're aware of 5%, 2,500, 80% of which 2,000 are negative or limiting in some way. It's a four to one ratio. It's like I would say to myself, I'm gonna write a book. And my brain will say, you can't write a book. Why would you write a book? If you could write a book, everyone would write a book. <laughs> no, I wanna write a book. <laughs> And on and on and on, like that, all day. So 95% of our thinking is just kind of happening. We're only aware of around 5% of it. 80% of it is negative or limiting in some way. For every positive thought that we have, we have four negative ones. That's not my idea, that's just what is. We've been able to map that, and we know that to be true. So, can we unplug this thing? The answer is no, because if they unplugged it, they would unplug you, and that's a subject for a whole other book. <laughs> but what we can do is learn to unplug from it. We can unplug it, but we can learn to unplug from it. So that's what the word unplugged represents. That's what the first piece of research in these three pieces, the unplugged dog dreams, Unplugged represents all of that, that we have all of these thoughts, 50,000 a day, 80% are negative or limiting in some way. 40% of 40,000 of them are negative or limiting. I don't know if that's the wind. I wasn't moving. Oh, it may be. Okay. We'll edit that splash. Don't unplug them. Really? <laughs> like the Matrix. <laughs> so unplugged represents all that information. So now we go to dog. Okay? Scientists wanted to study something about dogs, stimuli and response, and what happened was they built this really large sized dog maze, about the size of this room, and they lined the entire floor with kind of chicken wire so they could run an electrical charge through it, and they put this dog in there. And so they put the dog in the little thing, now this is pretty gross and I don't approve of this or what have you, but at least we can maybe learn from the findings, okay? But they put the dog in this dog sized maze and they shocked its little paws, and boop, dog hightails it out of there, finds its way through the maze. So they keep on doing this dog in the maze, zap it, boom, zap, boom, stimuli response, stimuli response. We've all heard of that type of stuff, right? So then, next part of the experiment, they take the little doggy and they put him in a harness, kind of like a straight jacket, can't move. Put him back in the maze, shock its little paws, it tries to move, it can't. Shock it, try, move, try, 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 try. Finally, the dog just gives up. And they shock its little paws, it tries to move, or it doesn't even try to move, they shock its little paws and it just stands there. They shock it again, and they're watching. It just stands there, just passively taking these shocks now. But the real interesting part of this experiment was then they took the dog out of the harness. And they shocked its little paws, and it just stood there. It was completely free to move. It was no longer harnessed. And they shock it again, and it just said, shock, 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 shock. And this came to be known as the learned helplessness phenomena. That as a result of being harnessed for a period of time, even when that harness was now removed, it acts as though it is still harnessed. Okay, so the learned helplessness phenomena. So we have unplugged, this automatic thinking mind with all the self-talk. We have dog, which is the learned helplessness phenomena. And now we go to dreams. Okay, researchers were really curious back in the 60s what dreaming was. What function did it serve? 
what was the purpose of us dreaming every night? They knew that we dreamed every night. They had discovered in the late 50s, early 60s that everybody dreams every night. No question. We might not remember them or be able to recall them, but this process happens in our brain. And what purpose did it serve? But they didn't have the sophisticated equipment that we have today for analyzing brainwave activity and all this other kind of stuff, so they had to figure out an experiment. And so what they decided they were going to attempt to do was they were going to attempt to study the dreamless mind. And so at that time they knew that when dreaming began, that rapid eye movement would occur. Right? And so then it, whenever you began to dream, your eyes would dart back and forth and back and forth. So they got their dream research lab all set up and the, the subjects agreed that every time the rapid eye movement would begin, that their sleep would be interrupted and those dreams would be interrupted. So the, the, the experiment begins, and there they are, sleep, REM, interrupt, sleep, REM, interrupt, sleep, REM, interrupt, sleep, REM. After only three days of doing this experiment, it was called off, it was announced to the world what they had done, and they, was told, they put out, whatever you do, never do research like this again that they found that what was happening was completely and totally unethical. Because what happened to the people in the dream research lab is they all became very disturbed. They all became very angry, very uncomfortable with life, suicidal, violent. And some were so disturbed that they actually attempted suicide. All because they were not allowed to dream. So 20 years later, they decide to study what dreams were really all about again. Except now we've got all these incredible tools and we can map brainwave activity and exactly where it's going on and what lobes of the brain and all this kind of stuff and study the... And what they, one of the things that they found is that there was absolutely no difference, zero difference, between the brainwave activity that occurs when we're dreaming at night and the brainwave activity that occurs when we're daydreaming in the day. That the process that takes place in the brain is identical. That regardless of whether you're dreaming at night or dreaming at day, that what's happening in your brain. Like when you go into your mind's eye and you're like in a, kind of in another place sort of. Precisely. When you're visualizing how you want to build something or you want to go somewhere or how you want to change your life or get a new job or planning a vacation, that type of daydreaming, there's no difference between that visualization during the daytime and at nighttime when you're dreaming. They have the same effect on the human body. So now comes the significance of unplugged dog dreams. Is there anything we've talked about so far that might be waking us up from our dreams. And I submit to you now that we want a better life. We want a better world. We want to see things change. We want to increase our income. We want some changes in our life and we want to grow and expand and what have you. And at the very same time while we are dreaming those dreams for ourselves, we've got this four to one negative ratio that's sitting there waking us up, get real, get real, get real, get real. And then we sit in a state of learned helplessness. And we have this harness of negative thinking that is occurring that keeps us in a state of learned helplessness. Now, on a scale in the psychology of it all and in the world of psychology, a one-to-one -one ratio, so one positive thought, one negative thought, would be ideal. <laughs> That would be the balanced human being. A two to one is kind of an irritable human being. A three to one is someone who has outbursts of kind of anger every now and then. A four to one is considered post-traumatic stress disorder. Five to one is considered manic depressive. Six to one is considered BPD, borderline personality disorder. Seven to one, schizophrenia. 8 to 1, you're psychotic. What is this ratio? I didn't catch it. 
This is the positive to negative thoughts. So one to one is like you're balanced and everything's cool. Two, you're kind of irritable. Three, you can be angry pretty re regularly. Four to one, post-traumatic stress disorder. So basically, the research that has gone out and that has proven that basically the entire population of the United States, as well as the world, is living in post-traumatic stress disorder. Okay, so the only way I can really confront the mind control that's happening in your lives and right here is to ask you guys to, one, give yourself permission that you want to learn something new, and then two, give yourself permission that you're going to blow your mind. Okay? Because the only way that you can understand the mind is to realize that you are not your mind. And as long as you believe you are your thoughts, if you believe you are your thoughts, and that that thinking thing is who you are, then you are under mind control. As long as you believe you are your thoughts, and that that thinking thing is who you are, you are under mind control. Precisely. So let that sink in, because that, that, that's... that's, that's that's the crux of it. Because no one can change your mind and no one can make you change without your consent. But as a result of all the programs that have come in and all the different hierarchical levels of things that have occurred in your life, from the moment you came in and all these definitions that were happening to you, you don't even know you gave your consent. Because you, everything that we have been exposed to you and me alike. And I'm, I'm working against this stuff every day. It's just because I know it doesn't mean it's not active. I've got to work with it every single day. So we're going to go outside. I'm going to take it to the edge because you guys are like right here with me and I can say this. Did you know that your thoughts aren't actually even your thoughts? Well, your thoughts are actually biochemical and neurological impulses that are occurring. They're an automatic process that's just happening. And that when you have a problem, okay, let's say you have a problem, you got to solve a problem in your life. Right? I got a problem. No? It's real stressful. What happens is, is that what what problems are is a chemical disequilibrium that's occurring in your body. You have a chemical environment where you get a yucky feeling. This is a technical term. <laughs> and you have this sensation that's occurring in your body. Now, over the series of processes that you've learned over your life, you apply in linear terms these concepts and ideas and these thought forms which are all eliciting chemicals to try and neutralize the chemicals that are causing that yucky feeling. And when you have thought through the various serious series of thoughts enough and enough and enough and you've elicited enough chemicals to get rid of that feeling and you've neutralized it or equilibrated it, you then have the aha experience where you're free from that yucky feeling. And here you think you're thinking thoughts, you think you're using logic, and all your brain is doing is applying these linear recipes that it thinks are thoughts to equilibrate the chemistry of your body. That's very embarrassing. <laughs> <laughs> How did it go there? I didn't want it to go there. Well, a lot of it has to do with, okay, I'm going to take this lecture in a whole other way because you're bringing up a great point. Okay? 
We are drug addicts. Okay? We are addicts to feel good all the time. Okay? And you got something called neuropeptides. That was the word I was looking for before and I couldn't find. That's it. Neuropeptides. Basically chemicals that make you feel good or can make you feel bad. But we get addicted to the good ones, like we're always supposed to feel good all the time and everything in our reality, part of the mind control, is pushing you to that carrot you can never effing have. <laughs> because the basic control mechanism of mind control is that who you are is not enough. That who you are is not good enough. And then we are thrust into this if-then reality, as I call it. If I only do this, then I can be happy. If then, if then, if then. And I always go into, I have a lecture, I have a whole series that I do on relationships. Right? And love. What's love? Okay, from my perspective of having been able to die and come back in and out and do this whole thing, I realize that love is essentially an eternal force. It is a fifth element, just as the movie was saying. If earth, wind, water, fire, love. And the problem is, as I get into relationship with someone, and I'll say, okay, Priscilla, I love you. Right? It is impossible, actually, for me to love her. Really what happens is that in her presence I allow out of myself or I align myself with that which is love. But she's not causing it. I'm causing it. I'm opening myself or aligning myself to that which is always there. If you're not feeling love, it's no one's fault. It's because you haven't aligned yourself with that which is that eternal presence. Everything, peace, harmony, caring, every trait that you could say that way is eternal. It's always there. You're either aligned with it or you're not. No one is the cause of your feelings. Now, when we get in this idea that she's causing my love or, okay, up for a camera, my wife, Morgan. Okay, Morgan, sorry. I fell in love with Priscilla for a second just because of my mind game. I'm done, baby. All right. <laughs> That's not love either. <laughs> really? Precisely. Well, what happens is, is that if I think my wife is that which is causing me love, she becomes my love dealer. Like my drug dealer. And then I want to know when my drug dealer is going to have the next supply, and then when I'm going to get more, and that she's not giving that to anybody else, and that she's going to be my sole source, and then I want to control that, and know that, and la 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 la. Wow. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Which is another part of not knowing who you are. I'm going to keep coming back to the idea that if you are concerned about mind control, stop looking outside yourself and start looking inside yourself. Because when you know who you are and what you are, you are uncontrollable. This is one of the tenets of what Gandhi used to teach. It was the whole tenet of what Gandhi was saying with Satyagraha, peaceful non-compliance. What he said was just matter-of-factly, he said, the British are going to leave. Now this was the most tyrannical thing you could possibly say. They ran everything. All the economics, all the you know agriculture, everything that was run by India was run by these few hundred people called the British. Stop blaming us. Yeah. <laughs> and he just simply said, he saw, he knew that that wasn't going to work anymore. And he just said, no, they're going to leave. I, I see it. I know it. They're going to leave. It's all done. It can't, con it can't continue like this. But they will leave as friends. This them that we don't like. I'm here to say there is no them. 
that that which we see outside ourselves that we don't like is in fact an extension of that which we have not accepted about ourselves as individuals. When you get into the quantum physics of how it all works, you talk about how everything is conserved. You guys know about the law of conservation? Right? There is no loss or gain. It's all just transformed. Never any loss of water on the planet. It's either in vapor, it's in clouds, it's in snow, it's in ice. No destruction. Right. The same is true for thinking. In that everything is perfectly always equilibrated. Think of a trait of a human being that you don't like. Don't shout out any names right now because everyone will have some. But someone who's irritating you, something that's awful, something that you don't like. That negative trait that you are identifying, that trait, that human trait, let's say it's selfishness or arrogance or something like that, vindictive, mean, whatever that trait is, by you identifying and giving meaning to, okay, because we give the meaning to it, there's no meaning in it, we put the meaning on it. By us giving that meaning to it, we create that negative charge. But the negative charge isn't out there. The negative charge is within ourselves. And in order, so we are holding up part of the equation, and they have to be that way for what we're saying over here to be true. But when we are capable of saying, well, you know, I've been an asshole sometimes, and I've been selfish sometimes, and yeah, I can see how that is, and actually, you know, their being like that is really a benefit to me, because I'm realizing that I don't want to be that way, and I can be able to talk to all these people, and I equilibrate it chemically with inside myself. I literally neutralize the charge that is holding them in that state of consciousness. And the physics experiment that proves that is that they found, you know, the, in quantum physics, they say that the basic building block of everything is the photon or light. That everything on, in the whole universe, in the physical world, is built upon light, the photon. So scientists actually split light in half, creating the positron and the negatron. They then boxed them up took the positron 11,000 miles away, set it up in another laboratory, synchronized two atomic clocks down to the nanosecond, and then electromagnetically they changed this positron to a negatron, and at the exact nanosecond, the negatron 11,000 miles away changed to a positron. Then they changed the negatron to the positron, and at the exact nanosecond it switched back. So the things you are holding charge to, you are keeping manifested. This is one of the tenets of mind control. Think about who you are busy being. Think about the negativity. Think about what you are projecting. And to show this in a very physical way, we're going to do a group exercise, but before we do that group exercise, is there someone who would like to volunteer to come up and do something? Okay, come on up for a second. What's your name? I'm Nicholas. Hey, Nicholas. I'm Joe. Hey, it's a pleasure. Right on. What's going on? It's your dad, Bob? No, my, my, my dad's passed on. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. Well, no, that's cool. <laughs> okay, because is, is he in the camera? Come towards me just a little bit. Oh, wow. Okay, you yeah. Put, you can put me on the web? Yep. <laughs> <laughs> You're 15 minutes of fame, man. <laughs> There's a reason why they call it a web. Yeah. <laughs> so, how many of you are f familiar with uh, kinesiology, muscle testing? All of us, right? I am. Okay, so what we're going to examine here today, right now, with Nicholas, is we're going to see the effects of positive or negative thinking through doing muscle testing. Okay? So, you willing to do that? Sure. Okay, can you face forward? Just right here. Okay? And what I'd like you to do is I'd like to, you to extend your arm out straight to the side of your body here. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to establish what's called the baseline. We're going to see how strong he is. Okay? So, I'm going to take these two fingers. You see that? And I'm going to push down. And what you want, I want you to resist. 
Okay. Okay. So I'm going to push down and you hold your arm up. Okay. Very good. All right. Now relax your arm. Now what I would like you to do, and you can do it privately and to yourself, is I'd like you to close your eyes and I'd like you to start thinking negative thoughts about yourself. God, I'm worthless. I'm useless. Man, I wish I could make more money. I just, you know, if I'd have done this, I'd have done that. Whatever it is that you can just really muster it up. Say it with gusto. Really, just get it into yourself, you know, God, I mean, piece of shh, or whatever, you know, and just I'm trying not to do this sort of thing. Just do it right now. I dig, man. There you go, trying again. But really, just pump it up. <laughs> and go ahead and just keep on doing the negative thoughts. Negative thoughts, really, I'm useless. I can't stand myself and what have you. Put your arm out to the side. Keep your arm out to the side. And I'm just going to do this and really kind of pump it up, pump it up, pump it up. Not two fingers, one finger now. Keep on, you know, just I'm awful. I can't stand myself. I can't stand myself. I can't stand myself. So, relax your arm. Okay. Now, what I would like you to do is I'd like you to start thinking all the positive thoughts about yourself. God, I'm a beautiful human being. I love myself. I am so beautiful. I am wonderful. I am really a selfless being. I'm really here to serve the planet. God, I'm just, you know, so many people love me and I love it. Just on and on and on. Do it with gusto. Really just love yourself. Really, really, just as much as you can. Just fill yourself up and just pump yourself up with those positive thoughts. Go ahead and just do it as much as you possibly can. And then extend your arm out to the side. And I want you to keep thinking those positive thoughts as much as you can, as much as you can, as much as you can. Yeah. Not one finger, not two fingers, my whole arm. And he pushed up. Okay, relax your body. Okay. His arm came down because I pushed so hard, but if you saw, it stopped. I could not push any farther. Okay, now what I would like you to do is I would like you to look at me and I would like you to think as many negative thoughts as you can about me. How much of a waste of time. Wait, but, but before you start, <laughs> please keep those thoughts to yourself. <laughs> and project as many negative thoughts as you can possibly at me. Just come on, you know, guys, just waste of time. unplugged dog dream. What is that? He thinks he knows about mind control. What is he doing? Just a waste of time. It looks pretty scary to me. It looks like that. Come on, just come on, come on, you do better than that. Just ramp it up. Come on, give me some negative thoughts, man. Pump it up. You need better than that. I'm an asshole. You know, come on. Okay, now put your arm out to the side. Put your arm out to the side. Keep those negative thoughts. Just keep on pumping them up at me, 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 pumping them up at me. Relax your body. Now what I'd like you to do is think as many positive thoughts as you can and you can extol those beautiful virtues to the entire world. <laughs> no, you can keep them to yourself. It's okay. But start thinking really positive, wonderful, beautiful thoughts about me. And how wonderful it is and how beautiful it is and just like, oh man. Wow, that feels good. Thank you very much. Come on, more wow, positive. This is like a contortion. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Suicidal. <laughs> and then place your arm out to the side. Keep positive thoughts about Joe. Joe Marshall. Wow, this is so great. I'm so glad he's here. God, all this information is so wonderful. He's a beautiful human being and I really love him. And on and on and on. And push and push and push. He's listen. Okay, and relax your arm. Okay, let's hear it for Nicholas, everybody. You can have a seat. Mind freak. <laughs> now, the purpose of that exercise was to illustrate that regardless of the target, regardless of the target of your negativity, whether it is yourself or outside of yourself, who's depleted? Yourself. Think about that. Or something else. Right. A Absolutely. Or Absolutely. Or the Republicans. Or the Bilderbergs. Here we call them the Democrats. <laughs> or the Democrats. <laughs> or the Trilateral. Or the Trilateral Commission. <laughs> oh, Americans. Yanks. <laughs> yeah, you can call them a lot of names. Any. One side calls them one name. The other side calls them. All the bloody Yanks that are the world. And there you witness the essence of mind control. We all do. The weak and subservient beings. That they will come through and keep the peace. When we were thinking about that human trait before, the negative one that we could do, right? 
There are 4,366 human traits as defined in the English dictionary. I've looked them up. How someone can be happy, sad, joyful, selfless, angry, vindictive. 4,366 human traits that we create the meaning for, whether it's positive or negative. And I guarantee anything that you look at in life that you put a negative spin on is your own denial of being that way yourself and is completely and totally depleting who you are and all of your efforts. And this is why I bring up Gandhi again. Because he knew that. He simply stated, without violence, without anger, that they'll just leave. And they'll leave his friends. <laughs> and that is what I hold to be true. That the things that we see and we know are going to end. And I hold that to be true. And in fact, the Bilderbergs and all those groups and everybody, they've done more for the advancement of human consciousness than any other group on the whole planet. I'm like, thank you, God. <laughs> because in the law of conservation, there's no loss or gain. And as all that heaviness and all that darkness and all that other kind of stuff is happening over there at the complete, at the exact same time, there's this big ball of light and love and all this beauty and all this other stuff. It can be no other way. Where your free will lies is in either focusing on that darkness or focusing on the light. Now the key element though is to not get caught in creating a charge towards either one. Because just as much as we can have resentment and create a negative charge, we can create infatuation or a positive charge. And so we hold these ideals up that, oh, this is so beautiful and what have you. And in order to lift that up, you have to put yourself down. And so we live in this world, our psychology, our brain, this is what it does. It goes through the world through similarities and differences, similarities and, differ similarities and differences. It's what I call the PDR in my spectrum, you know, the spectrum I told you about when I died on either end. And on one end, it's called the SDR, which is the spiritually driven reality is what I call it. And on the other end is the PDR, the psychologically driven reality. And the psychologically driven reality divides all that is united divides the indivisible, separates the inseparables. And the SDR unites all that is divided. Now where your life is happening is in the SDR, is in the repeatlessness moment. That's where it is occurring, in the here and now, where everything is fresh and new. But then we reflect on it and then we project into it and all this other kind of stuff over here in the PDR and we think that this is who we are. And everything about mind control that has come at us for the last 300 years has been about separating you from this because when you are here, they don't have control. One of the first mechanisms that was put into place was the Gregorian calendar. It's the calendar that we have today, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, 2008. And in one of my, I mean, I've been looking for what I consider to be the, the biggest dogma on the planet. Okay, dogma being defined unquestioned belief. What is the biggest unquestioned belief on this planet? The way you time. What day it is. <laughs> and what happens is, is that all the aboriginal people, all the people who were in tune with nature, who were what we would call now in ecological terms, ecocentric people. You have ecocentric and you have anthropocentric. Anybody read The Web of Life? You know that book? Check it out. Very good. Ecocentric, anthropocentric. Anthropocentric people are those who believe that they are separate from the environment and that the environment is there for them to manipulate for their well-being. That's an anthropocentric person. Do we see any of that on the planet today? 
And an ecocentric person, which were the primitive cultures, not only believed that they were part of the environment, in fact, they didn't even separate them as part of, they were the environment. That their bodies are cells that are in the environment, that are interacting with it. And they had this intuitive connection with everything, with all of life and what have you. And the Catholic Church saw that, hmm, that's not a good thing because if they're free and they have this intuition thing and they're all connected to the earth, we have no control over them. So hey, you know what? Here's a calendar. Boom. Today is today. And it will be this way tomorrow, it will be that way, and put everybody into schedules where now every consciousness around an ecosystem is centered around its calendar. In fact, who you are is measured by a calendar, by how many widgets you can produce by three days, four days, five days. That's your value. And your age, and what you can do, and when you're going to go to school, and when you're going to graduate, and when you're going to this, and blah, blah, blah. It's not real. It doesn't exist. And that was one of the very first control mechanisms that came into place. Not the whip. Well, <laughs> that's another one. Well, see, what happened was is that <clears throat> hundreds of millions of people, yeah, hundreds of millions of people were killed because this didn't go down easy. Right? They were saying, you're crazy. This is just some stupid thing you created. When did they do that? When did they create 1,578, I believe, was when it began being was the Mayan institute. Or even before that? Oh, yeah. Because, you know, I, I was reading William S. Burroughs said that that's what it was all about. The Mayan calendar was about controlling people. Really? I encourage you to read or go on to Google videos, L Google Ian Lung Gold, I-A-N-L-U-N-G-O-L-D, Ian Lung Gold. Because you've got Terence McKenna, you have all these different theories about what the Mayan calendar was about. Now, Ian was, a, was fascinated with it, and he was studying it and what have you, and had his ideas, but then, and I can't remember the scientist's name, I believe he's from Switzerland or the Netherlands, he was a microbiologist, and he had a fascination with the Mayan calendar, and then eventually the guy over here in Europe found out about his work over here, and it turns out when you put their two works together, they absolutely prove what the Mayan calendar was all about. It's no longer theory, no longer conjecture, no longer ideas, and it's presented by Ian Lungold. After he shot the video, his heart exploded unexplainably because it explains exactly what's happening on the planet today, where we are, where we've come from, and what's about to happen. And it's not a bad thing. Everyone's all worried about, ooh, 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 the Mayan calendar, you know that. Watch his thing and you will see that what we're about to expand into has nothing to do with time and has no longer any identification with your mind. Some of us probably have already caught glimpses of that. Absolutely. That's why we're here. That's why we're in this room right now. Well, they told me they had gimmicks. <laughs> Okay, real quickly, because I could talk two hours just on this subject. Are we doing good? Everyone okay? Okay, before we go on, before I continue, I would like all of you to take five, maybe six minutes, find a partner, and try that arm exercise. Put it on right now. Put it on today. I've done it with all my children, every other human being that I've ever interacted with, that I've become friends with. I do that exercise. Take the minute now to instill that into your body, into your neurology. Okay, did everyone get a chance to do the arm exercise? <coughs> did you find the same experience to be true? Maybe someone has, I'm not aware of it. Yeah, so that you can see the actual pressure and resistance and stuff. Yeah, I don't know of any. But I imagine someone has. <laughs> yeah. 
<laughs> yeah, yeah. Does that mean that if you're going to fight someone that you should think about how awesome you are and not about how much you hate them? <laughs> That's probably a really good idea. That's probably a really good idea. If you find yourself in that situation. Yeah. Bring it on. Okay. Okay, so, so far we've discovered that our thoughts are not our thoughts. They're just biochemical things that are happening that when we're actually problem solving and we think we're thinking that actually what we're doing is a whole chemical recipe and, 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 and experiment in our body to try and neutralize and equilibrate all of these chemicals and that negative thinking def infects us and creates weakness in us. And that any time we polarize a situation or we try to blame someone or we put someone in some type of group that is separate than us and we put a negative charge on them, that the person who is actually depleted is myself. And my wife and I had to turn off our TV after the, sec or the, after the, after the uh, vice presidential debate because yeah. we were literally getting sick. Yes. Yeah. I, Me too. <laughs> We were literally like feeling colds and coming on and like a flu thing and we finally realized, holy cow. Yeah. So does that mean we, we need to tell ourselves that this is wonderful? Is that what we no. No. <laughs> yeah, well what what we talked about is that, that is finding that, that center place. I mean, I do a two-day workshop where we extract, the, it's called, I call it, I couldn't know what else to call it. It used to be called the PSET method, polysynaptic equilibration techniques. And people just, yeah, they didn't remember that. And so I called it empowerment. And the idea behind the empowerment program is to look at all the fundamental building blocks of your personality. I build models, ask questions, you go in, dissect your life, understand where you got every thought, every belief, every understanding that you hold to be true in your life, equilibrate it so that you are free of all of that programming. What does that word mean? Equilibrate. Equilibrate means to neutralize or to bring to balance. Find balance. To find balance so that you're sitting in the center. Because on the quantum level, um, you know, what you have is imagine this rod sitting here and then it goes like this and goes like that and goes like that. And you see this waveform going like that and going like that. And what you have is the positive and negative going side to side. So at the very bottom here, you have war, you have peace. And you realize without war, you couldn't have peace. Without peace, you couldn't have war. Wars have happened. They're awful. We don't like them. But they've also have created peace. And when you come to peace with that idea or you come to the equilibrated fact, what happens is you have what's called a collapse in your consciousness. And you collapse those two things and now you come up a little bit higher on this thing. And instead of being these real broad swings at the bottom, now it's a little bit smaller. And so now instead of war and peace, you have love and hate. And when you realize that you are capable of love, you are capable of hate. And you acknowledge that about yourself, and there's a whole process of learning how to do that. It's, I mean, I'm making it very simple. You collapse that, now you come to peace and calm. Or, you know, agitation and calm. And what happens is, is that as you go through those 4,366 traits, which you don't necessarily have to go through all of them, because what, what happens is, is as you begin to do this process of collapsing all of these polarities that you hold true to be in your brain, you keep on coming to higher and higher levels to where then you're just going back and forth like this and you just sit in the center. And I was just talking to my daughter and my daughter's 21 or 23. You know, it's just amazing, man, because my kids grew up with all this. I mean, I, I, home, I birthed my, I delivered my children. I grew their food for the first five years of their life, homeschooled them. They grew up in a whole nother reality. Didn't watch TV. And so they got this stuff. And they're like disseminating it to their friends. And she, we were just talking about this because things are even coming up for her from her childhood. Stuff with her mom, stuff with me. And I'm there like saying, yeah, you're right. I was a jerk. I'm so sorry. <laughs> you know? Because I never pretended to my kids like I knew it all. I would always tell them, listen, I'm pretending. <laughs> In fact, every human being is pretending. <laughs> <laughs> so just because I'm a big person doesn't mean I'm right. So you can check me anytime you want. And they did. But my point is, is that in that idea of this sliding back and forth like that, her analogy that she just gave me like two days ago, and I'm going to get her name Shanti. Shanti is her name. Shanti Marshala. Oh, 
Om Shanti. Shanti Ramana and Namaste are my children's names. Lovely. And um, anyway, so Shanti said her analogy for it now that she uses is like a pendulum on a clock. And she says that every time she equilibrates something, that, that little thing gets shorter and shorter and shorter and shorter and shorter so that she's no longer taking these huge, dramatic, emotional swings, but that she sees both sides real quickly and real easily and what have you. Yes? Okay, that's why teenagers, we blame it on hormones, but Syrian teenagers are all over. Uh, well, traditionally, not, I don't know anymore. Yeah. Well, there's several different there's several different things that are going on with our kids, and we're gonna, you know, I maybe have to do a series of things here. I, are you guys okay? You want me to talk more because there's some things I can share specifically about that, but it's gonna take us a little off topic. Right. Okay. Specific to teenagers, has to do with the drug intervention of the children who were being born. When they're being born, the birth process, the stress process that takes place between the mother and the child. Okay. We think of stress as a bad thing. Stress is not a bad thing in and of itself. There are three levels of stress, and we're going to talk about those in just a moment. But stress in and of itself, anxiety or challenge of any sort, create the chemical makeup in order for you to have new synaptic pathways. So in other words, there's, there's, a, there's a particular chemical makeup that is required in your brain in order for you to have new synaptic pathways. Okay, so there's a, when those chemicals are elicited, and the only thing that elicits those chemicals into your brain is stress, anxiety, or challenge. So the very things that we push away are actually there to create an environment whereby then we can learn. Now, most of our teenagers and most of the kids who are 20s, what happened was is that that natural birthing process is very stressful for the mother and the baby. And it's set up that way environmentally so that when they have that huge, stressful, kind of challenging experience and then the baby finally comes out, all those new synaptic pathways of the instinctual learning of how to breastfeed, how to do all this stuff, all of those things are there and that whole bonding process is there. But what we have done is we've created birthing as a disease and we shoot the mother up with chemicals so that she doesn't feel the stress, doesn't feel the anxiety. And these chemicals affect the child at the same time, so the whole bonding process, the whole neurological development at that moment of birth is interrupted. Uh-oh. And what do we see? We see a whole we, we see a whole generation of children who are in fact disconnected. And they start getting well, not just the well, it's a lot more than just that. The, taking the baby immediately the out of the mother's hands and putting them in like a I've never given birth. I won't have a clue. <laughs> <laughs> there are many, many influences. There are many influences. My understanding is that is the primary first experience that sets us, sets up a... overwhelming or overriding factor among other factors. Is that what you're saying? That's what I'm saying. Something like that. Absolutely. It's very influential compared to other influences. It sets up the entire neurology of the brain. Precisely. Well, okay, then this is the other aspect of this that we're going to get into, okay, because there are environmental concerns. Okay, the average adult like you and me has more than 3,000, on average, around 3,500 known chemicals, petrochemicals, non natural chemicals in our bodies. On average, 3,500. Brand new babies, this is from the World Health Organization, with over three quarters of a million children sampled. So it's a huge worldwide sample. The average baby being born today has more than 200 known chemicals in their bodies before they even come out. A majority of which are carcinogenic. Carcinogenic, lead, mercury, arsenic, I mean, all different types of plastics and PCBs and all this other kind of stuff. Now, yes. I just wanted to say tomorrow there's actually a free lecture on campus about that very thing about how many toxins are in your house. Mm-hmm. Is Guinness toxic? In. So if anybody's, if anybody's interested, it's all naturally made, man. See you later. Yeah. Um, but if anybody's interested, I can email. Just give me your email, and I'll forward it to you. Okay. I actually have an entire website on that subject. 
heavymetaldetox.biz. I, I believe, I believe uh, as the chemical industry developed in the sickness, it was, you know, I mean, right in parallel. Right, it. absolutely. You can see, you can see that uh, the, the sickness, uh, you know, all kinds of illness just started creating, being created because with a number and the, and the proliferation of a greater number of chemicals. Precisely. So you and I, you and I on average, when we were born, had somewhere around 30 to 75 chemicals in our bodies is what is projected. Now when you think about you're born, you're trying to integrate all of this reality, you're having all of these influences from people telling you who you are, what you are, then you have these chemicals in your body. And these chemicals actually each one has its frequency, you can actually measure everything, it exists on a frequency level, everything in life is a frequency of coagulated matter and you can measure its frequency and it has a free frequency signature. You have that machine? <laughs> I, I wish I did, no. And so we have those types of influences as well in the formation of who we are. Now clearly there are certain chemicals that are being allowed into our water system, into our food. I'll give you one more statistic about chemicals, okay? This one just blew my mind when I got it. Okay, imagine all of the grocery, or imagine a grocery store and all of the pharmaceuticals that you can see in the grocery store. So like the decongestants and the aspirins and the do 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 do. Okay, you see that, right? Now imagine all the grocery stores that have that aisle. Now imagine all the pharmacies or drug stores, okay, in the world. Then imagine all of the hospitals and the pharmacies in there. Now imagine, so all of that, all the grocery stores, all the drug stores, all the pharmacies and the hospitals and the private pharmacies, all of that worldwide only represents 25% of all the pharmaceuticals that are manufactured. The other 75% are in our food. It's called biosecurity. Money, money, money. And it's called maximizing yield. And it's used in our beef, our cattle, our pigs, our hogs. Milk in China. Milk in China, fish. Oh, you name it. Right? So, okay, all of that stuff is influencing you, especially the heavy metals and the poisons. Those are known as neuro inhibitors. Okay, and they affect your neurology. They shut it down. The mercury fillings in your teeth, on and on and on. So, another aspect which we won't even get into as far as mind control is to do whatever you can to limit your exposure. And then beyond limiting your exposure, finding ways to get them out of your body. Now, I've been researching this for 25 years, been studying nutrition, have been doing that. I myself am a vegan. I myself have been vegetarian for over 25 years. I myself have done over probably 20 different types of cleanses. I myself created a consortium of doctors called the Optimum Health Group of over 150 practicing physicians, either MDs, NDs, ODs, chiropractors and nutritionists who have been putting together protocols for detoxification. And there's only one product that's come out in the last three years. I make no money selling this product, so I'm not trying to push that product. I did bring it here today if we came to this. And if you haven't heard of Natural Cellular Defense, NCD, it's a liquid zeolite. It is the only product that is not a liver-based detoxification. Everything else that you can do, what it does is it goes into your body, kind of stirs up the heavy metals, the poisons, the things that you don't want in your body. Then it is up to your liver to filter them out and push them out. <laughs> and then what happens is, is that yeah precisely well what happens is is that your liver is only capable of removing your liver is only capable of removing somewhere between 10 and 15 percent so the other 80 to 85 percent 
the 85 to 90 percent that got shaken up by the things that you put in there, the chlorellas and all that other kind of stuff, actually get redistributed throughout the body. And so anyone who's ever done a detox, they'll have detox reaction, get headaches, aches, and pains. That is those chemicals being redistributed throughout the body. This is the only thing that doesn't do that. This is completely and totally different. What is that called? It is called natural cellular defense. If you go to heavymetaldetox.biz, I have cards here for that website for those of you who want to come up to me. No, what it is is it's actually an all-natural mineral that occurs as a result of volcanic eruptions. Okay. And it's Mother Nature's way of detoxif detoxifying all the chemicals and sulfuric acids and all the other kind of stuff that comes out of volcanoes. Now the problem is that you can buy zeolites in all different types of forms, but the problem is that their receptor sites have already been saturated. They've done their job for Mother Nature. In other words, all the heavy metals, everything, they, they, so basically it's like a sponge that's full. These guys who put this together and it costs about a dollar a day to do, so it's very cool. Um, they found a way, and they're the only ones who did it, how to clean the zeolite, how to clean all the zeolites, how to get rid of all the heavy metals, all the poisons that are in it. And so what the, and then the real brilliance came about where they attached the zeolite, the micronized zeolite, this mineral, natural mineral, they attached it to a water molecule. And what that did is that totally transformed the way that we can detox our bodies because anywhere water goes, which is actually through the tissues, through the bones, through the organs, actually anywhere hydration goes in your body, it carries the zeolite which irreversibly bonds to the heavy metals and poisons and you just pee them out, bypassing any of your body's necessity to do it. So it's brilliant. Is it a voyeur? Yeah, precisely. And so Optimum Health Group, this is one of the things that we recommend. And I, on the, at that website is all of the patents, all of the research, all of the, I mean, you name it. You go there, it's all there. Like I said, I make no money. But I'm telling people, you want to be out. So, okay, myself and several of us are actually doing a kind of experiment in consciousness. And as a result of being on this product, what we found was that we grew up with all these vibrations inside of us and the various meditation techniques and clearing techniques and focus techniques. All these techniques that we learned were to um, were in order to compensate for these vibrations and stuff in our body. And we learned to compensate for them so that we could get our consciousness to a certain point and then we can maintain that, but we needed those tools in order to get our consciousness to that point. Once we started taking this product, in less than two months, the necessity for using those tools to get to that same level of consciousness was no longer required. That that which we were compensating for on a vibratory level in our beings, we didn't have to do anymore. We, just, we were just there. So it's something you really want to consider. Yeah. And we had two questions over here. You had one before? And yeah. Well, the, the thing is, is that zeolites have been used for years and years and years. Like when Chernobyl happened, that's what they spread all over the ground. Wow. Your, your, your water filters or your filters that are in for water filtration and or for your pools all have zeolites in it. Kaopectate has zeolite in it. <coughs> right? I mean, so it's not something that's... A, the thing is that it, all the petrochemicals, all the heavy metals, all that stuff have a high positive charge. They are what's called a plus two positive charge. Okay? There's nothing that we've been ever able to find, or nothing that, excuse me, nothing we could manufacture that was more negatively charged that was not more toxic to the body. And so this is the only thing that occurs in nature, the only thing that they've ever found that occurs in nature that is more negatively charged than all those heavy metals and poisons. Not even clay? More, there's like 10 times that of uh, bentonite. And bentonite only works in the uh, lower abdominal area, you know, through the GI tract. This goes throughout the entire body. Okay, so that's just on that. I didn't even want to get there, but you need to understand that those chemical controls are those harnesses that leave us in that state of learned helplessness. Okay, so we just like saw the front porch and we saw the back porch, we just brought it all back together. But those chemicals that are in your body are also causing that four to one negative, negative ratio of thinking that's occurring. So we seriously want to reconsider, you know, what it is we do there. Okay, now, I'm going to try and conclude because we're getting to, you know, it's getting very long and I could talk on and on and on. But there's two stories I want to tell, okay? 
And what I'm trying to do is build pictures for you guys so that then you can hold those pictures and then that can help you to affect how it is you're going to relate to the world. And we're probably going to have to do another lecture so I can get to the whole other section of what it is we want to do here. Real quickly, there was a friend of mine who was starting a new business. And it was a very large business. He had millions of dollars. He was starting something. And so he got all these executives and all these different people together for the first day of work and they're in the boardroom. He introduces everybody and I'm giving you the Reader's Digest version of this story because I want to get through it real quickly. But anyways, on the very first day of work, he says, okay everybody, what we're going to do is we're going to put together a 2,000 piece jigsaw puzzle. And they're like, oh good, a group activity. La, la. <laughs> he says, but before we do that, what I want you to do is I want each one of you, one by one, to come into my office and I'll show you the box cover. So one by one they file in and unbeknownst to them, to each one, he showed a different box cover. <laughs> so they finally all see their different box covers and they get into the room and they decide, they get started and they all decide, okay, well we'll get the edges together and that's something they all can agree on, the flat edges and what have you. And then, and then somebody says, um, hey, give me all the green ones, I'll put those together for the middle. And someone says, there wasn't green in the middle, there was a lake in the middle. And there was a lake in the middle, the water was down on the side, it was brought in. Before you know it, all the communication breaks down, everybody thinks that the other one's crazy. <laughs> and so he lets this go on and on and on, and clearly they're not making any progress and everything's like out of control and what have you. And eventually he says, okay guys, I played a trick on you, I messed with you, I showed you each a different box cover. So now, what I want you to do is all you come into my office and I'm going to show you the actual box cover. No tricks, I promise. No tricks, nothing. But really study that box cover. Really study every nuance of it. See the whole box cover. So they did. They studied it and what have you. They went back out into the office or into the boardroom and within just a couple hours they finished the 2,000 piece jigsaw puzzle. And the purpose of that exercise was to have them experience that when everybody sees the same big picture, then they all can work together in harmony and that if a piece comes to them that isn't part of what it is they're doing, they know where it goes so that everyone can work together and build the big picture. Now I was going to talk almost a half an hour on just that one piece of information specifically because how many box covers are fed to us? How many shows are there on television? Well, <laughs> how many ways of thoughts are there? Christianity, Islam, Catholicism, Hinduism, Buddhism, all of the isms. Every single one is a different box cover. And the thing that, that, that I talk about is that, that um, it's kind of like every human being, the way I try to explain it, is that every human being is like a piano. And you've got all these strings, okay? And all the strings are tuned in there. And as you're growing up, you're, you, you're kind of playing with your piano and you play a note and someone says, no, don't play that note, that's a bad note. And you keep going and playing, someone says, oh, don't play that note. And so then you begin to learn these scales where the notes you can play and the notes you can't play. And so you have your Christian scales, you have your Republican scales, you have your Libertarian scales, you have your Islam scales, you have your Atheist scales, you have your Gestalt scales, when in fact all the notes are okay. But as you bonded in this reality, you were told that certain notes were not okay. And this is where we create the charge. This is where we create the separation, because in truth there is no separation, there's only one being. Right now there's a lot of different facets of that same being in here looking at itself, thinking I'm talking. But in reality, it is only through the perceptions of our mind that we go into the PDR, the psychologically driven reality, whereby then we separate that which is inseparable, divide that which is indivisible. dualizing the unity that really exists. So if there's any one big picture to look for, it's who you are. Because when you truly understand who you are, you then understand who we are. Very critical part of that mind control. Until you understand that you are not your thought, you are not your mind, you are out of control. So what 
tools do you offer to work through all the, you know, the trauma and fear and the expectation and the mm -hmm. judgment and everything? Well, I'm glad you brought that up. Because I happen to write a book about it. <laughs> Commercial. Be right back there. Everybody on that back table. Um, there's a million different ways to get there, okay? And the way that, I, if there's any one thing that I do, I mean, one of my first teachers that I really hung out a lot with in, when I was very young was a guy named Ram Das, Richard Alpert. And I'm really grateful that I had the opportunity to hang out with him only because his big thing was that everybody is a different combination code. And that there's a million ways to get to the same way. In fact, one of the things that he says is that we're all standing around the same mountain looking up at the same peak and we all have different paths. So I encourage you to open yourself to attract. I'll try it, man. I'll try it. Right on. Well, in my, I'm not, well, what I'm doing is I'm trying to not, not sell my book per se because I didn't come here to sell my book. I thought if anyone's interested in it, great, because this is, in fact, a dissertation on learning about how you are not your mind, what are the things that are getting in the way that are causing you to believe you are your mind, and then how to work out about it. At the, at, you know, the name of the book is Repeatlessness, and half again, the whole half of the book is the eighth chapter that I call Recipes for Repeatlessness. How to live, how to turn your everyday moment into a conscious activity where everything is fresh and new. And that's what the whole book is all about. So, you might want to check it out. If you want to read some or watch some videos about it and stuff, what's that? Are you, are you going to make any copies available this evening? Or? Yeah, I have a whole box of them. Actually, I have a whole series of tools that I've created. Okay, I have something that's called the Healing Garden. And one of my mentors, a guy named Dr. Lee Polos, who actually started what is known as sports psychology and envisioning and using visualization and stuff like that. Okay, now how many of you guys do affirmations? Actually work with reprogramming your, your brain? Okay, because if you don't, I don't like the word reprogramming, but okay, additional programming, neutralizing. I'm going to brainwashing. Brainwashing. <laughs> you prefer that? <laughs> the reason I the reason I ask whether or not you do that is because that unless you do, you are running the programs that are in there automatically. And you've got that four to one ratio that's going on without any control whatsoever. With the idea of affirmations, okay, it's as simple as this. One of the definitions of insanity, you guys have heard this, the is thing going the same thing over and over. and That's right. Ex using the same thoughts, the same behaviors, the same procedures. And each time you go to do it, and you do the same ones, but you expect a different result. So I have created audio programs that you sit with and work with, but if you ever do these types of things, you have to understand that one of the other things that is part of my dissertation is the idea of what I, I created something called tri-voice technology. And that is that the reason affirmations didn't work and this whole new age thing became kind of crashing down is because all we ever worked with was the first person. I am this and I am that. I am this and I am that. I am a millionaire. I am a, I am a, I am a. When the source of all those eyes were the you, he, or she statements. What now? The you, he, and she statements. So I'll give you an example. When I work with my affirmations or I am creating them, I use what is called the tri voice technology. So I, Joe, am a loving and beautiful person. You, Joe, you're a loving and beautiful person. He, Joe, he's a loving and beautiful person. I, Joe, am a genius at whatever I do. You, Joe, you're a genius at whatever you do. He, Joe, he's a genius at whatever he does. That's right. One of these not a genius. 
<laughs> well, whatever it is you want to do now, there's actually 11 levels. Of genius. <laughs> yeah. There's 11 levels at which that programming occurs. In my book, I, I spell out all 11 levels. I offer you those three today. So as you begin that, I have a CD that teaches you how to do all that kind of oh, stuff and goes through. That? Pardon? Which book are you? Repeatlessness, my book. Oh, it's that same book. Yeah. I have that in chapter 8. But there's 11 levels at which that programming occurs in the voices in your head. And until you take control of those voices, they have control of you. And you, you, they were put in you. You didn't ask for them. Have you seen that t-shirt says, I obey the voices in my head or something like that? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what? There's something in my head, but it's not me. Yeah, I can't. <laughs> I think that's the key floor. Everybody's in there. I can't get them out of there. Yeah. Okay. Throw away the key. So our base here is we're not our thoughts, we're not our minds, right? Correct. No. Right? Correct. Okay, so, and, and this goes to be programmed. Right. But if we re, even with affirmations, if we reprogram mm -hmm. ourselves, are we still our thoughts and minds? No. Yeah, okay. The way that I work with that, because you're absolutely correct, and God bless you for bringing that up, man, because I, I wish everyone was hanging out in the space that you are now to realize what he just said. Uh -huh. Because right. the way I look at it is that the mind is like a room. Okay? The mind is a room, and it's a room with all the furniture strewn all over the place. So the couch is like this, the lamp and the stereo and all that kind of stuff. And to get from one part of the room to the other part of the room is really difficult. And you're like trying to wiggle your way through all that kind of stuff. You got it. And so essentially, <laughs> precisely, working with reprogramming the, the room, getting back to some source wounds that are causing biochemical reactions that are going on in your body, is all about cleaning the room so that you can navigate through that room very quickly and very easily. But the problem is that we get stuck. We, we don't realize that there's anything outside the room. We don't realize that there's doors and windows and that outside the room even exists. Because we're so busy trying to navigate all this crap. So, part of cleaning the room up is balancing out the different types of thoughts and emotions and chemicals and equilibrating, as I call it, all of that stuff. Because when that mind is not agitated and messed up and nerdy and stuff like that, it is much easier to step outside of it and observe it. Okay, so you have steps. You have to Correct. step outside the mind and look back right. at the mind and see what it's thinking in the stream of consciousness and how that's engaging you and entangling you. And Absolutely. But once you step outside, you're no longer entangled. Yeah, right, right. But the, what you're saying too earlier, what you made some very profound statements there about the chemical, the synergistic of all these influences, whether they're physical or psychological or ideas or teachings or conditioning and programming, they're interfering with this ability to get back to the real self, maybe, or something. Yeah. They're separating you from your real self. Absolutely. And they're, they're nurturing the glorified self, mm -hmm. false self. Yep. So you bring that up in the book? The yep. Like flicker rate? That's yep. good. That's good. You've got a good book there. Thank you. So, lastly, I guess we'll close on, because I, I could talk so much longer, guys. <laughs> what I wanted to do was begin to introduce to you... He's been staring at me all night. What's the field of... My goal was to introduce to you yourselves. What now? My goal tonight was to introduce to you yourself. Because the quality of your life is the quality of your life is based on the questions you ask. That's right. And until you ask, who am I? What am I? Because everything that mind control is is about taking you away from your individuated self, taking you away from your point of view. And my friends, your point of view is sacred. Your point of view is sacred because you're the only one who has it. I might not be sacred, but unique. It is sacred. It is your birthright. And your birthright, your birthright has been stripped from you. 
and your birthright is being influenced and your mind has been hijacked by ideas and thoughts leading you to really unconscious behaviors. Yeah. So I leave you with this. Do you guys, okay, I can leave you with a story that will take about three minutes or I can talk for ten more minutes and give you some really pertinent information. Do you want me to go to the ten minutes? Yes. Are you okay? Okay. Knocking pictures off the wall. Thank you. You walk into your room that way. Be careful how you walk through your room. We want to do that all night. All right. So when when you're ready, let me know because I want to really have focus. If everyone could just look into my eyes for just a moment so I can connect with you because I really want to get this information, this particular piece, it's very important. This is a very important piece. And I just want to thank you all for being here and participating and giving us the opportunity to carry this on because right now what has happened is that we have literally shifted the universe. Every particle Every vibration in the entire universe has been shifted as a result of this conversation tonight. And that there are millions upon millions of people across the globe right now having this exact conversation and these exact thoughts. And we are aligning ourselves with that vibration and that is why we are here tonight. And if there's ever any meditations, every other thing that I do on my radio show, I bring it up. I have a weekly radio show every Monday from 11 to 1 called the Cup of Joe show. It's on the co-creator radio network. It's an internet radio station. They're about to do micro broadcasting with 300 watts. Co-creator network. Co-creator network. How do you spell co? C-O dash. Yeah, C-O dash. Yeah, creator network. It's a really cool network and this conversation is happening on the network. Not just with my show but all the other shows. Very cool stuff. Very, very cool stuff. Um, okay. Everywhere I go, um, there's not a place I go anywhere in the world where a single human being denies that what they want is peace of mind. But what is it? What is peace of mind? And the best way that I can define peace of mind or how one attains peace of mind is that one has peace of mind when one has certainty. And one gains certainty through the recognition of patterns. I'll give you an example. When you first learned to drive, were you certain about it? Did you have peace of mind about it? No. It was like trying to figure out gas and brake and how you take the corner and how fast you speed up or slow down and all this other kind of stuff, but you did not have peace of mind. You were nervous, but once you began to recognize those patterns, you then had certainty about driving, which then gave you peace of mind. In order for you to be free of mind control, you have to recognize the patterns of your own thinking. Because right now the patterns of your thinking are being pulled in every which direction. You're being told to think this, think that, believe this, believe that. You have all these automatic thoughts that are going on. And until you extract yourself from that, will you not until you extract yourself from it, you will not have certainty which will not lead to peace of mind. You have to see the big picture that you can put all the pieces where they belong. Now there are three levels of stress. I have to put this out. This was the most important thing that I wanted to give you. There are three levels of stress. The first level of stress which drives us from peace of mind is what is called the walk away response. Okay? When you have the first level of stress, what we, what we define as stress is actually the second level. By the time you can feel it and define it, you're already at the second level. Right? The first level of stress 
is what is known as the walk away response. So you're going in the grocery store and you happen to see like this couple fighting and you kind of steer away from it. Yeah. Right? And dogs do the same thing. Something happens. They just get up and walk away. Right? right? No. Walk away. Now, when we are not allowed to walk away is when we get the drop of adrenaline and we go into the fight or flight response. That is the second level of stress. That is generally where we notice that we are being stressed. We're feeling it in our body, our shoulders, our stomach, or something like that. We have already entered the second level of stress. Now, when we were growing up and we wanted to get away from whatever was stressful, mom, dad, fighting, sisters, brothers, whatever it is, and we're told, no, you're not allowed to do that. So we then go into fight or flight. It's like, you stop that. So then we're not allowed fight or flight. Then we go into the third level of stress, which is unconsciousness. And unconsciousness is a coping mechanism that is the mother of all addictions and the father of suicide. That when we were not allowed by our mothers, our fathers, our teachers, our bosses, our community, our churches, all of that to exhibit the walk away or the fight or flight, we have found ourselves in this unconscious behavior and one-third of the United States population, 100 million plus million people, 100 million people are on some form of antidepressant. Isn't that also like a state of learned helplessness? Absolutely. Of learned helplessness. They're, they're in what now? Say that again. Over one third of the American population, a hundred million people are on are on antidepressants. What? Are on antidepressants. Drugs. Xanax. Mm -hmm. Xanax is terrible. On and on and on. My point in saying all of that is that is there anything we're exhibiting that's creating stress in our lives? Are there any box covers that we're being told to believe? Is there any polarization that is occurring? Is there any type of thought patterns that are forcing us that we're not allowed to act, we're not allowed to say things, we're not allowed to fight or flight, we're not allowed all this kind of stuff, and so then what do you see is a whole society of unconscious people who are internalized all that, all that anger, all that rage, all that stuff, who are now all different types of rageaholics, alcoholics, pornaholics. Do, do you see? Do you see uh, an element of inducement of a dissociative behavior in this? Absolutely. That, that's really what you're. Yeah. Because Colin Ross up in Dallas has uh, had that down pretty well. Yeah. Yeah. No. There's absolutely the 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 the, 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 the this area of, of DID and and MPD. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. He's talking about the, the dissociative. What happens is is that we go into a virtual world as a coping mechanism. Yeah. Now we talk about fear, right? Because we say fear of the unknown. I'm going to close off with this. Fear of the unknown. Fear of the unknown is impossible. There's three areas of knowing that exist. And maybe some of you have heard this. There's that which we know we know. So we know how to tie our shoes. We know how to make wa you know, coffee. We know that we know that. Then there's that which we know that we don't know. Like, do you know the escape velocity for a rocket to get out of the atmosphere? No. I know that I know that I know that I don't know that. But then there's this third area that is that which we don't know. That we don't know. Whoa. And so if you don't know that you don't know it, there's no concept whatsoever. It's not in there. How could you be afraid of it? So fear of the unknown is impossible, and really what fear is, is fear is letting go of the known. You're letting no go of your comfort zone. The repeated thoughts. Precisely. Because the truth of the matter is repeatlessness. Every moment is fresh and new. Now fear, the, uh, the acronym that I use for fear, it used to be false evidence appearing real. That's what people have used. That's not true. It's fantasized events appearing real. <laughs> Say that again. Fantasized events appearing real. Yeah. F-E-A-R. Appear appearing to be real. Correct. Okay. 
So for those of you who no longer want to have mind control, I share this last story and I'll do it as quickly as possible. There was a monk who really thought he was missing something. I mean, he's been meditating, he's been studying, he's been reading his books, he spent his whole life looking at this, but there was something he was missing. He just didn't feel like he was getting it like the other monks. He didn't know why. He was very frustrated. No, no, he wasn't getting it. So one day, he goes to his teacher and he says, Teacher, what is it that I'm missing? What is it that the other guys understand that I don't understand? What is it do I have to do? And his teacher stood up and motioned for him to follow and they walked out of the temple and they walked through the woods and they get to a lake and the teacher walks out into the lake and turns around and the student comes in front of him and he takes the student, puts his hands on his shoulders and puts him under the water. And so the student just surrenders and thinks he's having this beautiful baptism, he's going to have this incredible experience and what have you and nothing's happening. And eventually he's like running out of air. And so he's like, he tries to stand up and the teacher holds him under the ground, under the water. And he tries and he's struggling, struggling. The teacher would let him up just for a little tiny breath and you push him back down and hold him, hold him. And finally the guy was just getting weak. He had no more oxygen. He was just, but he, something in him just gave one last surge and he pushes up and right then the teacher lets him go. And he goes, what were you doing? I mean, I, I, I ought to kill you for trying to kill me. What's wrong with you? Why were you trying to drown me? And the teacher looks at him and he says, my son, only when you want your own liberation as much as you wanted that breath will you find what it is you're looking for. So we've been playful tonight. We've danced around a lot of things and I pushed against that programming. But only when you want to be free of that as much as you want your actual breath will you find what you're looking for. So thank you very much.